Perhaps it sounds a little more realistic in slow motion. Here you can see that the cam rubs on one side of the tappet and causes it to rotate, the whole shaft rotates along with the hammers and shoes. With the removal of the screen or filter you can now see the hammers in action. When we use it to actually crush rock, it's very interesting to see that the hammer is still rotating when it hits the rock. It actually causes the anvil to start coming unscrewed, it's only held in from a screw from the bottom. There was a lot of debate over the years as to whether the stamper worked by a crushing effect from the impact of the blow or a grinding effect or a combination of the two. Well, I think it's quite clear from this that it was actually grinding as well as the, the impact. More recent research has found that a lot of the crushing takes place as a result of particles interacting with each other rather than interacting directly with the hammer. This is a photo of an unusual ore feeder mechanism which is used in the big battery. It has a clutch kind of mechanism or brake that connects onto the rim of this wheel as it rotates and when it's near the bottom it'll grip onto that rim and it lifts it up until it's about horizontal and then the brake shoe loses contact and it drops back down and the process repeats resulting in a repeating motion. In my model I used a ratchet system instead and this gradually rotates the wheel around. Quartz rock comes down a chute from the hopper onto this disc, but if the disc is full of rock, it won't fill any more. Then there's a wiper that should be present on the top of this disc, so that as the disc rotates around, it wipes the rocks into the mortar box ready for crushing. The vertical arm for this ratchet system is driven by this lever, which is operated by the second stamper. If there's too much rock underneath the second stamper hammer, it won't drop all the way, and therefore the ratchet will not operate. And the mortar box will not get overfilled with rock. The frame is made of aluminium, and the shaft and cams are brass. The cam followers or tappets, as well as the hammers and their shoes and the anvils, are all stainless steel. In front of the stamper, we see some copper plates. Well, actually, they were Munts metal. It's a kind of brass that was named after Mr. Muntz who patented it for naval use and it's 60% copper, 39% zinc and about 1% iron. They used this metal because mercury would stick to it and as they washed the powdered quartz and gold mixture over these plates the gold would stick to the mercury and form an amalgam which is like an alloy similar to what they made fillings out of. Every so often they would have a clean-up operation where they stopped the stamper battery and scraped the mercury off these plates. And you see in this photo a picture of an amalgam which doesn't appear to have a lot of gold in it, but that's what it looks like. And then they'd put the amalgam in a retort and heat it up a couple of hundred degrees and that would make the mercury evaporate. They would collect that in a condenser and reuse it. And left behind would be this mixture of gold and silver called bullion. The proportion of gold and silver would vary depending on the location of the mine. In this close-up of the model you can see the tappets and the cams that lift them. And below that we have the hammers with their shoes and the anvil on the bottom. The shoes and anvils would wear out in about a three month period and they'd have to be replaced so they are made removable. The shape of the cam is based on this curve which is known as Archimedes Spiral, since he discovered it in 300 BC, but these days it's more commonly known as an involute curve. The main characteristic of an involute curve is that constant rotation of the shaft will result in constant lifting of the cam follower. So it puts a constant load on the steam engine or water wheel which is driving the system. As illustrated by these two cams that I made, there's quite a lot of variety in the shapes, and this depends on the weight of the stamps, the height of the drop, and the speed of the machine, which is usually about 100 stamps per minute. The speed of rotation is a critical factor, actually, and that's because there's a certain amount of time it takes for the stamp to drop under gravity. And if you don't allow enough time for the 
stamp to drop all the way before it comes to the next cam cycle, the dropping tappet will hit the next cam and damage it. This is known as camming. These machines evolved over time and this is a fairly late model cam which has a rather steep slope on it and a long gap between one arm and the other and that gives plenty of time for the hammer to drop before the it engages with the next arm of the cam. This means that the machine can be run faster with higher productivity. Another modification was to use a shorter drop so it didn't take so long for the hammer to fall and therefore you could run it faster. But the impact on the rock was decreased by the shorter fall and to compensate they would increase the weight of the hammer. As long as they had enough horsepower to drive it, this would result in greater productivity. Now in this town there is a tourist attraction called Gold Mine Experience, which is completely run by volunteers. They actually have a gold mining license and they'll take you underground to see what it looks like. This is the huge stamper battery which is used to crush the quartz in order to extract the gold. You can't get close to the moving parts of course, but uh, here are some still photographs showing the cam system. There are spiral shaped cams which lift up hammers which then drop and hit the quartz and crush it into the consistency of sand. The actual height that these hammers drop varies depending on how they adjust the position of the cam follower on its shaft. You can see they can be moved. The whole plant is three stories high and this is the second level where tourists are allowed to go and it is pretty impressive. You can see the stampers moving up and down and the water coming out through the screen and all the rest of the process. The course comes from mines up in the hills behind the stamper battery and they use gravity to help them transport it. It goes through a jaw crusher to reduce to the size of golf balls. Comes down into hoppers in the back of the stamper plant before being fed by an ore feeder system into the mortar box where the hammers are. They don't run the stampers for very long and since they turn it on and off frequently and they have quite large numbers of tourists going through, they often run it on an electric motor. But periodically they'll start up the boiler and use their tangy steam engines. Currently they've got one steam engine operational and they're working on replacing the bearings and the second engine to get it operational. This machine is known as a Wilfleet table, W-I-L-F-L-E-Y. It does basically the same job as a person using a gold pan. The water and sandy material run over the top of the table and the heavier materials tend to get caught behind the ripples or rails on the table and the lighter material gets washed over the top and out the bottom of the table. So the gold gets trapped behind the ripples. Now that's not the end of the process. The sandy material that comes off this table is still processed further. And here we see the ball mill. It was filled with steel balls or otherwise pieces of flint. After being passed through the ball mill, it then goes on to the burdan, which is the final stage. And this is a, like a dish on an angle and used to have a cannonball in it so that as the dish rotated around the cannonball it would roll around and crush the quartz. Most of the burdans had a metal slug, a steel slug you can see here just being dragged across the surface and instead of causing a crushing motion it's more of a grinding motion. Often they would put quite a lot of mercury into the burdan to amalgamate any more gold that was released. In the early years, the majority of stamper batteries were run by water wheels. Later, ANG Price got the license to manufacture the patented Pelton wheels, which are a kind of efficient turbine for using high pressure water to operate the stamper batteries. Steam engines were used from quite early on 
but were a more expensive approach because they required a supply of coal. But as competition for water increased, steam engines became more common. And during the summer, when the water supply ran low, they would need to use steam engines. Just as you arrive in the town of Thames, there's a welcome sign erected by the Rotary Club. And beside it is a reconstructed stamper battery. And it's quite interesting to look at because you can see quite a lot of the damage I've been talking about with overcoming the engines. There's bruising and uh, broken parts, including this broken cam follower, which has been turned upside down so they can continue to use it. In fact, they were designed to be turned over when they get worn. Here you can see bruising on the cam due to over revving where the cam has come down too early and hit it. In this example of a cam follower or tappet, there are tapered wedges hammered in from the side and they press a metal plate called a gib against the stem to hold it in place. Often the tips of the cams were cut at an angle to match the curvature of the tappet as it fell off the end. The shoes and anvils are very well worn, but it's interesting that they are worn so evenly due to the rotation. I think the mushroom shape we see in the centre is related to the fact that the grinding motion is more effective around the edges of the circle than it is in the middle. But it may also be related to the flow of the pulp or slurry back in after an impact, bringing material more around the edges than it does in the centre. 